You know, this is something I've thought about doing for well over a year now. We've been planning it for months. This equipment has been sitting in my office for weeks, and we are fin- I'm finally able to say it. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever, welcome to the Two-Wheeled Rider podcast. I'm your host, Mario Orsini. I'm joined here on my right by my co-host, Brian Boyer. We're actually doing this thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's... um. It is something we've talked about for a while. Um, first off, let me just go ahead, you know, elephant in the room. If you guys are watching us on YouTube right now, you're probably wondering what's going on. We've got two guys sitting here talking into microphones in an office, totally different than what you're used to seeing, but please don't worry. We will be back. I mean, we're not going anywhere. Travel videos, back in the garage videos, all that stuff's still going to happen. You're just getting the podcast in addition to that. And you can go get this podcast anywhere you get podcasts, whether it's iTunes or it's Google Podcast or uh, iHeartRadio, Spotify, any of them. It's going to be available on there, obviously audio only. But if you want to watch us for whatever reason, uh, you can watch it on YouTube. And we're also going to split it up into some smaller segments on YouTube to make them a little more bite size. You know, maybe five to ten minute long segments versus, you know, the entire hour podcast or however long it ends up being. But, um, yeah, man, we're excited to uh, kick this off. Each episode, this is probably no surprise to the, you guys that have been following me for a while. Uh, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a glass of bourbon. This time we've got a bullet bourbon. Don't ask what time of morning we're recording this right now. Typically, we would not be drinking this early, and we're gonna try to do this in one take because if it takes multiple, it's not gonna go well. So, cheers. All right. Um, so. We've kind of touched about or kind of touched on already about how this is going to be available on YouTube and it's going to be available other places. Uh, those of you that have been following my channel for a while, you know, you guys, I've gone over kind of like my history and stuff, but we're probably getting some new people tuning in for the first time. And I have to recognize that there's new subscribers that come in every day, every week. And also people that just happen to find our podcast out there. Uh, I feel like I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. I know Brian's been on the channel. Sorry, man. Brian's been on... <clears throat> channel plenty of times and you know people have seen you but again you're not in every single video and so anyway we want to get into a little bit about us and then we want to talk about what you guys can expect from this podcast and then finally not at the end but we'll get into the meat of things where we're going to talk about uh, rider sponsorship and a lot of the things we go over in terms of rider sponsorship will also translate to just or racer sponsorship will also translate to um you know, recreational riders, and then even even other sports and, and other ventures you could get into, a lot of the same principles are going to apply. But it's the two-wheeled rider podcast, so it's going to apply to motorcyclists mostly. So anyway, um, those of you new, my name is Mario Orsini. Uh, I've been riding since I was five years old. Started out on a mini bike, probably like a lot of you did. Uh, eventually got went on to some larger bikes. And I've uh, been riding on the street now for... I don't know, how old am I, 22 plus years already. Um, after college, got into some uh, got into some road racing, did that with uh, CCS and Weir for a few seasons. That was fun, but it, it was pretty obvious I was never going to win a MotoGP championship or get a factory ride, and uh, that stuff is kind of expensive to do. And I really come from an entire family of motorcyclists, and most of them, uh, their motorcycling was about touring. And I remember being a kid, and uh, my uncles and grandfather and stuff would come home from these trips, and, you know, tell these awesome, amazing stories about these places they'd been. And this was back before smartphones and digital cameras. So we would have to wait weeks for the 35 millimeter film to get developed and, and printed out and then put in photo albums. And then you get to see these amazing places they'd been. So that was something I always wanted to do. And eventually, I don't know, probably five, six years ago, I started doing that. And uh, I've gone through a few different touring bikes. And, you know, at this point, I've been to 49 states, including Alaska. I've been to five Canadian provinces. I've ridden in was it five, five European countries, so seven countries total. And then next month, you know, we're going to add another country to the list. We're headed down to Costa Rica to go ride. And, uh, you know, I have, I have gotten involved in, in some off-road racing. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, you guys probably can't see it over my shoulder. I'm really proud of my uh, fifth place uh, in, in uh, Vet C this past year in SXCS. Uh, that just means um, I was the fifth fastest slow guy age 30 or above is basically what that means. But it's still a lot of fun to uh, compete in. I've got a son that rides. I've got a wife that has a license and will occasionally throw her leg over a bike and, and actually onto the handlebars. I got a sister that rides. So, I mean, it's just something I've always grown up with. And that's actually how I got to meet Brian is, is through, is through riding and racing. And especially the fact that, you know, our kids are friends 
And uh, so, Brian, why don't you share a little bit about your background and, you know, your your life experience in, in motorcycling? Awesome. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, so Brian Boyer here. Started riding when I was four and racing at the same time. Started on a PW50. Raced kind of uh, from four to eight and then kind of got out of it a little bit. You know, there weren't as many kids doing the racing scene. So I went into the, the ball sports, but I, I kept riding. Um, just didn't race as much. Um, so once I got kind of older, was able to get, you know, another bike, a dirt bike and a street bike as well. And then really fell in love again with racing and really went hardcore into racing, working my way up to a class, really enjoyed riding on the street. It was more just, you know, day trips here and there, commuter bike. Once I met Mario, he pushed me, you know, outside my comfort zone and did a, an overnight trip with a wild and wonderful weekend and just absolutely enjoyed it. My wife came along and we've since then taken a bunch of overnight trips together. Um, so just really enjoying the, the two wheel atmosphere. Like Mario said, my son races as well. And last year we, we got into a lot of racing um, and it made me miss racing even more. So this next year, really hoping to get back out there with him and just ride together more, you know, go to races together, go on trail rides together. That's why I love motorcycles is it's introduced me to all my best friends and it's really a family, family affair. Yeah, speaking of your family, I mean, we still got to give Kathleen credit. I mean, on her first overnight motorcycle trip, we had we uh, we had her riding through the snow in the mountains of West Virginia yeah, while she was pregnant. Yeah, while she was pregnant, <laughs> and uh, she continued to want to ride on the back of your bike. So, I mean, that that says something. We actually had a lot of fun that trip, and to be fair, the weather was pretty nice later in it the day. It got better, yeah. But uh, once it's snowing, it doesn't get much worse than that when you're on two wheels. So anyway, we kind of bring different backgrounds. You know, Brian started out off-road, and, and, and he's still in off-road. And, you know, is kind of coming over to the street side a little bit, where I started out more on the street side and have come over to the off-road side a little bit. So he still kicks the crap out of me out on the dirt trails, and I can still hold him off on the asphalt. So, I mean, we both have our, our, uh, our strengths. And, our, and, our, and I've got plenty of weaknesses. So. <laughs> Same here. All right, so about the podcast, uh, this, these first couple of episodes are probably going to be a little bit different than, than what we're going to have in the future, but we had to get this kicked off, and uh, for the first couple, it's going to be Brian and I discussing a few things and, and sharing some of our knowledge that we, you know, we hope help you guys uh, listening in or at least keep you entertained, and then on later episodes, we're going to go into more of an interview format, probably in a lot of them. We've already reached out to quite a few people um, with diverse backgrounds when it comes to motorcycling. I mean, we're going to have people on, you know, talking about touring. We're going to have people on talking about off-road racing. We may have some on-road racing. Uh, we will get some female perspective. We're, we're going to mix it up. It's going to be across the board. And the guests we have lined up already, I, I don't want to share who they are yet, but those of you that watch YouTube, you're going to recognize either some faces or some voices, depending on, you know, how we're able to get them on here. Some of the folks will come here live in studio. Uh, others will Skype in or, or just phone call in, those sorts of things. But we've got some excellent guests lined up, and, and we're really trying to hit the gamut of motorcycling. We're not going to concentrate on just one aspect because we don't just stay in, in, in a single swim lane. We, we're out doing all sorts of things when it comes to bikes. I mean, if you would have told me, you know, four years ago, you know, I'd be hopping on a plane next month to go ride dirt bikes in Costa Rica. I hadn't thrown my leg over a dirt bike in 15 years, so I would have said you're nuts, but... Yeah, I think that's the cool aspect, right? I think even going forward, we're just looking at trying so many new things. You know, we've had a lot of experience uh, with motorcycles, but we're, we're not stopping there, right? We want to just keep trying new things, different disciplines. Uh, it's been exciting. Yeah, I mean, I've got to do some flat track. Last year, I was back on on uh, doing, a, doing a track day with uh, the guys at Ducati Winchester. And yeah, I mean, there's so many different things you can do. You may just have your thing you like, and we understand you're not going to tune into every single podcast because you're going to look at something and go, I'm not interested in that. And that's fine. You know, tune into the ones you're interested in. Um, for frequency, I think right now, uh, you know, we both work nine to five jobs. We, we put in a lot of hours and then we, you run a YouTube channel, which I haven't even plugged that yet. By the way, you can watch the behind the scenes of this first episode. Brian's been vlogging that and that, that ought to be pretty cool. Uh you can check that out on on the Boyer's uh, YouTube channel, and we'll figure out a way to link that somehow. But um, we're probably going to put out an episode every other week to start, and then with the goal, probably within a you know six month to year time frame, get it out on more of a weekly basis. And then if you guys are enjoying it, and you know we can line up the guests and keep everything entertaining and and keep it informative. You know, my goal would be to get out multiple a week, yeah. but. We're going to start out small. Every other week, you'll be able to uh, to access this podcast. 
and then uh, we'll we'll try to get it to weekly, maybe by maybe by the summertime or something like that. We'll see. But we've got everybody we've reached out to so far has been super excited and, and wants to be a part of it, and you know we're thankful for that, especially since. Up until today, we hadn't put out a single episode yet. So, you know, that's a lot of faith in us. Um, and then the other thing is, if you guys have specific topics you would like for us to cover, we haven't figured this out yet. Maybe we'll open up a Facebook group. Uh, you can definitely contact us via email with some ideas, suggestions. Maybe you'd like to be on. There's something you want to share with the audience. Uh, we're open to basically anything and everything when it comes to motorcycles. It could be ADV stuff. It could be street stuff. It could be off-road it, it could be anything, anything you're an expert in or know an expert in that you'd like to have one that thinks going to share some knowledge. Uh, you know, we're all about it. So anything else you want to add, Brian? No, I think that you hit the nail on the head there with, you know, we, we've been fortunate to meet so many different people with so many disciplines. And, and to your point, so many people are willing to come on this podcast when they don't even know really what it is. Yeah. It just it speaks to the community of two wheels and just how willing people are to help each other out. No, we've we've made so many great contacts, and I don't want, I don't even want to call them contacts. I kind of discount them. So many great friends. I mean, it, it's awesome, and uh, yeah, I mean, thankful to be a part of the community, and we just want to expand it out even more. And I think a way to do that is with this podcast. Uh, in addition, you know, it just kind of supplements the YouTube channel, or maybe at some point the YouTube channel supplements the podcast. We'll see how that works out. But anyway, speaking of supplementing, this is a little bit different. Than, uh, than the way YouTube works. So I'm going to play a quick ad, and then we're going to come back, and then we're going to get into the meat of things today where we're going to break down everything for you, everything we know about going after sponsors, how you can get sponsors, and uh, hopefully curb that learning curve a little bit to make it a little bit easier for you. So we'll be back in just a minute. All right, sorry for that uh, commercial interruption there, but we just wanted to throw that out there. If anybody wants to help support this podcast, uh, We'd love the support. This isn't like YouTube, like I was saying earlier, where I get ad revenue and stuff from it. Though the YouTube video, I would. It actually, you know, costs some money to uh, be able to produce this thing and, and host it so you guys can have it. So if you want to help out, great. But if you don't, hey, man, that's cool. We're just glad you are tuned in and listening. So this is where we're going to get into the meat of things. Uh, we're going to talk about rider sponsorship. We're going to break down some uh, some different types of sponsorship and, and some different avenues to get sponsored. So I, I guess we'll get into the, the three major groups of of sponsorship which is and they kind of go in this order i mean the first one's discounted goods and when i say goods i mean it could it could be services it could be parts it could be accessories it could be riding gear it could be any of those things and that's basically where you know your sponsor is saying yeah we're going to give you 25 percent off or 10 percent off or, or whatever the case may be and but that does kind of limit you into what you can use. Like if Fly Racing is going to give you that sponsorship, they better not see you wearing, you know, Troy Lee designs at, at the race. So, I mean, there's some caveats, and we'll get into contracts and those sorts of things. The next level is where a lot of people hope to get to, and that's free stuff because everybody likes free stuff. Oh, yeah, free stuff. And especially when it's stuff that you need anyway for, for racing. Or, again, keep in mind, I mean, any of this stuff could be for the recreational rider, the, the YouTuber, the, the blogger, you know, all those sorts of things. And then at the top level is money. Now, there are some rules with that depending on what you're doing, especially when it comes to racing. You know, there's, there's being an amateur, there's being a pro. But ultimately, I think that would be everyone's goal is to get paid to ride their motorcycle. And spoiler alert, most of us and most of you guys listening are never going to get there, but it's still something to strive toward. And all these things we're going to go over uh, can at least, you know, those steps are, are what are going to help get you closer to there, whether or not you get there or not. So um, we're going to kind of break this down into three different main categories of, of ways to get sponsored. Uh, and they're broad. So bear with us here. We've got personal relationships. We've got hook it, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. And then, you know, there's emailing, cold calling, and even throwing into that, you know, some of the major manufacturers or major suppliers, uh, also have an application process you can go through through their website. So maybe you don't just have to shoot an email out to a general account or, 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 or call a generic phone number. They might actually have some sort of application process directly through them. So I don't know, Brian, what do you want to – I got my own thoughts on Hook It. Yeah, let's dive into it. Okay, so those of you that aren't familiar, there's a platform called Hook It. It's not just for motorcycle riders. Like, they cover – I think they cover like surfing and soccer and, you know, all, all, all sorts of sports. It really doesn't matter. But it's, I guess in the last few years, it's become bigger in at least the off-road motorcycle community. I know there's road racers on there too. And it's a platform. They have an app. You can go onto their website. And it's 
to me, it's kind of like social media and a resume kind of wrapped into one where you almost have like a score sheet. So uh, have you used it? Does Luke, yeah, Luke use it? Yeah, I put Luke on there. Um, I used it probably 10 or, or 12 years ago. Yeah. I looked into it more recently. You know, kind of the same thoughts I think that you have. I had pretty good experiences in, in the beginning, but I think it's changed a lot because more people have gotten on it. Yeah, I mean, so, so the way it works is, is that we track, I say we hook it tracks certain things. They track race results. I mean, that's one of them. They track frequency. It just, again, when it comes to motorcycles, I don't know how specifically it works for some of the other sports, but, but you track race results. You track uh, frequency of racing. You track, I um, uh, forget what they call it, but basically like anytime you go out and ride, like you you can you can log into the app and say, oh, I Location, rode four hours. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah, how many different locations you've traveled to. And then they also track your social media following, which is part of the score. It's like if you have, you know, somebody, you could have similar race results to someone else, but if they have 1,500 Instagram followers and you have 200, they're probably going to have a higher score than you. Yeah, and it really combines all the social media presence that you have. It, and yeah, it does. It into one. You, you've got to log in and give them access to each of your accounts so they can monitor that. And it's not just how many followers you have on there. It's engagement, too. So you could have, you know, 25,000 followers, but if your engagement rate's low, you know, that's going to affect your score. And then ultimately, the way this is supposed to work, it bumps up your score. The higher your score is, the better you look in front of prospective sponsors and they'll reach out to you and say, hey, this is an offer we have. And in theory, you know, the higher your score is, the better the offer is going to be. And then, you know, the one thing I – also, if you want to pay, I think it's like $99 a year, you can have a Hook It Pro account. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you actually unlock all of the full features, and I think you can actually apply. Because no, I, I signed Noah up that, for that for like one year, and I was – there's a reason I didn't sign up for a second year. And then you can apply to the open sponsorships where I think the regular account, the companies can reach out to you, but not vice versa. Like they have to start the conversation. And to be honest, I think Noah's got like, I don't know, 30 offers sitting in there right now. I'm not going to sign up for any of them. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, and Noah's score is much, much higher than mine. And then some of it comes down to what race series you're into in that some of them automatically upload the results into Hook It, And those are verified results. And those are worth more than you loading them in yourself. So, you know, if you're in a race series, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I get that. Um, but if you're in a race series that doesn't upload them, I mean, you're going to be severely handicapped, you know, score wise. So I don't know. I just, I, I feel like it, it's become a bit scammy in that, you know, you sign up for a pro level account or whatever they call it. So I'm spending a hundred dollars a year. And then, you know, I could probably look into some of these offers and they're like, Here's twenty percent off no toil, and this isn't a knock on no toil. It could be any company. You're know, like twenty percent off. I mean, we're going to get into where we get better deals from anyway. But yeah. so that how many air filters do I have to buy to make back my hundred dollars yeah. that I've already invested? Yeah. And I think that's you know it's that excitement and wow factor, right? So when I first started, I went on here and you get offers, right? And suddenly you're walking around going, "I'm a sponsored rider." Mm -hmm. So you get these deals, and it is exciting, and then it kind of you think. That's as good as it gets. You're getting these deals. And I think as you talked about a little bit scammy, some of the things that I saw on there was they'd give you 50% off and like, wow, 50% off, but that's full retail. And then there's a shipping charge yep. that goes through the roof. And next thing you know, I'm paying way more for the product than what I could have just gone down to the local store and got. Yeah. And that, that, that's the, the other thing we found out, like, and I, I'm not going to call out the company and, and, and I actually like their products, but it's like, Hey, you're going to get. And I think the deal was actually pretty decent in this case. I think it was 55% off. and um, But it wasn't their entire uh, line. It was just part of it. And to me, it was almost like, well, this is the part we can't sell anywhere else, so we're going to give you the big discount on this. And then we went on to buy it. It's out of stock. So we literally couldn't even use the sponsorship for that company. So we kind of broke our deal and, you know, ended up going with another brand. But... You know, there are so many limits. It looks cool, and you're right, and especially for the kids. And to, to me, it's almost for the kids, but then you have to kind of pull them back in and go, yeah, we're not signing that deal because we got a better deal somewhere else, and yeah, you can't say you're sponsored by, you know, Arai, but we're going to get you that Arai helmet cheaper than, you know, you're going to get it through your sponsorship. So, I, I don't know. To me, I'm not – I mean, I still have an account on there. Noah still has an account on there. I would not – I mean, if you're – genuinely looking for good deals and to get sponsored, this is not the best avenue. 
If you want to go on and kind of compete with your friends and see who can get the highest score, it's fine for that. But then it's just something else you have to maintain because we've already talked about how the social media ties into that. Well, you're already taking care of the social media accounts. And now we're going to add into the hooking account. And the hooking account is really only seen by other people that compete in your sport and the industry insiders that use it. And what kind of sucks is there are a few companies out there that at least allegedly will only allow you to apply for sponsorship through Hook It. At least when you go to their website, that's what it, that's a bunch of BS. I mean, you can still get a hold of people, but yeah, it's been kind of my experience with it. I it's not not my preferred method for yeah, sponsorship. Yeah, I I do like the concept, right? I love the concept on the social media side, how it combines everything. It yeah. gives you a score, a ranking, it shows engagement, which is super important. And for those that don't know, it's not how many followers you have on your social media that's truly important. Companies care about how many people are engaging, how many people are asking questions. Um, so that pulling that all together in one place, I think that's really cool. But I just don't think the deals are worth it. I think we have a lot better ways for you all to get better sponsorships that we'll talk about. No, I agree. I think I think the concept's awesome. Like when I first saw it, I was like, man, this is a neat idea. I just don't think the the follow through has has been there. The execution. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Part, exactly. Right? So uh, I guess the next thing, um, at least in what I would consider my ranking, and I think Brian and I agree on this, is emailing or cold calling or, or applying through, through a company website to get sponsorship. Uh, because we're not relying on a platform at that point. You know, generally, you know, a real voice is going to be on the other end of the phone or a real person is going to respond to your email. But especially, and, and if you're going to send an email, don't just send an email that says, hey, I want to be sponsored. What can you give me? you know, there's things you need to send along with that. Now with the application process, it'll normally tell you like, you know, attach your race resume or, you know, send us your contact information and, and maybe your plans for next season, what you plan on doing. Um, so what we're about to tell you, you know, and what you need to send on that. And then also a little bit when we get to the personal relationship shot, personal relationship side is going to be pretty similar. So Brian, you know, you've sent race resumes and stuff in like, what are companies looking for? What should you, like, what are the things you have to provide? And then what are the things that if you provide these additional things, they're actually going to take a look at yours and you're not only going to get some sort of sponsorship deal, you're actually going to get a good deal. Yeah, absolutely. So first off for, for the resume, always put together a resume for sending in the companies and the other ways that we're going to talk about here. Um, after this segment, the resume is so important. So some of the key information that you want on there is, you know, I always have a little story, right? You want a cover letter. You want to talk about what value are you going to bring? You don't want your resume, just like with a job resume, to look like every single other person that sent one in. There's a ton of people that win races. They're, everyone's going to say that, right? They're going to list their top five races and their accomplishments. And you want that. You want to have your accomplishments on there, but you don't want that to be the meat of the resume. You want to differentiate yourself. No, I agree. I mean, if we're just going to list race results, I mean, uh, we can put that in an Excel spreadsheet and send it over. But, you know, there, there are other things you can provide. And you can talk about, you know, things like your social media following. But provide them a plan. I mean, eventually, you're, you know, if you get an offer, you're probably going to get a contract back. And it's going to tell you some things that you have to do as part of your contract. And they're usually fairly simple things to do, like use these hashtags at least once a month. You know, these sorts of things when you post on onto your Instagram or Facebook or whatever it may be. But go ahead and put some ideas out there up front. You know, go ahead and tell the company, hey, you know, I'd like to put your logo on the side here and I'm planning on racing these events. And I'm, uh, you know, I'd like to mention you guys in, in, in my social media thing. Or, hey, can I get some additional stickers? That way I can hand these out to my friends at the track. And Or maybe you've got some sort of hauler and you want to advertise them on it. There are all different types of things you can do, but if you're just going to send in, you know, your top five race results, it's going to be pretty much, and, and send some pictures in. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing saying on a race resume that you can't put some photos on there. Like show some cool photos because they may not go out to your, and this is another thing, list your social media handles on there. That way they can go out and check it out and go, hey, this guy's, this guy's for real. And they can see how often you post, what type of engagement you have. Because, I mean, let's be honest here. There's only one reason they're going to agree to sponsor you if they think sponsoring you is ultimately going to make them more money because they're a company and they are in business to make money. I mean, they've got, they've got people to pay. They've got to, they've got to pay for product. So you really, like Brian said earlier, you really need to show your value. What are you going to provide? And if you bring ideas to the table versus, 
hey, I'm I'm pretty fast or I race a lot. What can you guys do for me? Tell them what you can do for them. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to take that approach every time. Um, it's it's remember they're in a business, right? They need to make money, and the way they're going to do that is coming up with having new ideas. If they sponsor you, what are they going to get in return? And they're hoping that you represent their company, um, that they you help build their brand and and kind of a partnership with that. So I think you have to look at it always in that scope. Don't go into it going, I won a bunch of races last year. I deserve this thing. That, they don't care about it. No, that. I mean, you can, you can look at all levels of racing. And the highest paid guy is not always the fastest guy. It's the guy that's the PR guy. I mean, you st- you st- don't get me wrong. You still need results. You, you, st- you need Absolutely. to be good enough. But at the same time, you don't have to be the best. And, you know, I'm going to throw out one of my examples, and he used to be the best. And I think he is the greatest of all time. But Valentino Rossi is still pulling down way more coin a year than Mark Marquez, who's won, like, I don't know, five out of the last six titles or whatever. He's got a loyal fan base. So Yamaha wants to be associated. Monster Energy wants to be associated with him. Same thing when we go to the Supercross side. Dean Wilson, and we're only, like, two races into the season, has not put up great results. But he's got, he's got a loyal fan base. I mean, last year when he came into the season without a factory ride, he lined up big time sponsor. I mean, if we're being honest, he had a factory bike. It just didn't say Rockstar Husker Barn on it until he agreed to come over. But you know, these guys and and they're they're good brand stewards. And that that's the other thing. I mean, if you've got, you know, I, I know Noah's got a TikTok account now. I don't even really know what this is. It's these dumb music videos. But if you're on there, because they're gonna they are gonna look you up. They want to see who you are. And if they go on there and you're being a, you know, a jackass or, or they look at you and they're like, why would he post that? You know, it's something profane or it's something. They may not want you to represent their company. So be careful what you put out. Just remember, kids, the Internet is forever. It's not yes. going anywhere. And I think, yeah, always remember that, right? When they sponsor you, it's a contract between the two of you and you are now representing their brand. So everything you do, everything you put online is a representation now dotted line to this company. And they don't want to be associated with someone that's not what they're about. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, don't go. Be careful what you say about them because they are sponsoring you. I'm not saying if you have problems with their product, you don't bring that up. You should you should definitely bring that up, but don't bring that up in public. Uh, I was talking to someone the other night that had an issue with uh, some of their riding gear and, and brought it up to the company, and and they sent them back. And now they're going to make changes to it, but they could have easily just gone out and blasted them on social media which still would have got their attention, but probably not the type of attention you want. So, and yeah, I always find this funny because one important lesson for me, just too many people do this. Don't burn bridges. You never know. So if you blast that company online, one, you're going to never get a deal with them, but sometimes there's a lot of change in this industry. That person that was running the PR department there now moves to a different company and they remember you and remember what you said. They're not going to sponsor you at this other company. No. And and it goes in reverse too. you know, be nice to everybody in the industry because that guy that may just be the, the regional rep right now could end up being the national rep at some point. And, and if you build a good relationship with him on a local level or her, and then they get up to the, they're going to remember you. So, you know, you're going to, you never know where people are going to end up. Uh, you know, I've had employees in the past, and I've always tried to, cre- you know, treat my employees with the utmost respect. And whether I've moved on or they've moved on, you know, I always say, you know, you, you want to keep a good relation. I may end up working for them one day. Yeah, they were working Never for enough. me, you know, this week, but I may end up working for them five years from now. And I want to keep the, all those opportunities open. So same thing goes with this. And and I guess, you know, when it comes to the application process and and the and email and cold calling, be prepared to hear the word no. It's probably, especially early on, that's going to happen. Or just be prepared to hear nothing back at all. That happens pretty often where, you know, listen, if you want ProTaper to sponsor you, chances are there's 10,000 other people that want ProTaper to sponsor them. So if you haven't done anything to differentiate yourself when it when it comes to sending an application or a race resume, you might not even hear anything back. And don't be discouraged. Don't be upset by it. Just learn from it and go, okay, well, what could I have done better? And then I guess this would be a good transition to the next part. Maybe try to form a personal relationship somewhere instead of just being, you know, reaching out to, I don't want to say no name people, but you know, you're, you're just reaching out into the abyss. You're throwing stuff out there instead of throwing stuff out there. Uh, you know, 
reach out to people you already know. Yeah. And like what you talked about earlier with Dean Wilson and, you know, why he has such a great relationship, even if the results aren't there, it's per, it's a personality. So I think this is where the negative side of being able to send these resumes out is they don't truly get to see who you are um, as a person, your personality, what differentiates yourself. You can do the best you can on that piece of paper, but it's not all the way there. So I think that's where we transition into the personal relationship side. No, I agree. And this is, okay, so let me just get into one thing here. This kind of frustrates me, and this is why I stay off of off of forums because it's always just a bunch of experts hiding behind an avatar and you don't know who they really are. Like, you don't have to agree with me, and, and a lot of people aren't going to on certain things, and that's okay, but I'm going to show you my face and I'm going to tell you who I am and you know how to contact me versus being a keyboard warrior. And there are so many times, and may, maybe there's just a lot of bad dealerships in the country. I don't know. But there are so many times you go on and, and people just crap all over their dealership, their local dealer. Oh, that, yeah, I ordered this offline. I can, I can get it for 15% off and free shipping, and it'll be here in two days. My dealer, he wants blah. Have you tried to form a relationship at your dealership? You know, either because most of them are small businesses. There, there are a few exceptions where, you know, uh, one guy owns like five or six different dealerships. Most of the time they're small businesses. The owner's usually there at the, at the shop. You've got a parts guy. You've got a mechanic. You probably have a sales guy. Have, have you tried to be, and I don't want to say become friends, but stop in from time to time. It's okay to spend an extra $10 on something because guess what? If they find out you're going to be coming in there pretty often, then, you know, they're, probably going to work with you on stuff. They're going to go, Hey, this guy's a, this guy's a good steward for, for our shop. The other thing is tell your friends, you know, if you have a good experience at a dealership, tell your friends about it and tell them when they go in there, Hey, mention my name when you go in, ask for some or, or ask for so-and-so, you know, those sorts of things. I've done that at, at multiple dealerships throughout time. Um, because you know, when you first come in off the street and they don't know who you are, I mean, hopefully they're respectful to you and everything. But if you come in and go, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so, uh, Mario told me, you know, at least at that point, you know, the parts guy up there is familiar with who I am. And, oh, okay, yeah, we'd love to help you out. You know, th those sorts of things. Um, and it's not just limited to dealerships, but I know we've had great experiences at, at local dealers. Lots of times we've gone out and ridden with these guys. But, you know, in my case, I wasn't friends with any of these guys before. And now, you know, Lance, who's a parts guy at Shenandoah Honda and right on my, I mean, he's over at my house a couple of days a week or whatever. And I know some of you are going to go, oh, it's because you have a YouTube channel. And it has nothing to do with that. I mean, these guys were, I was friends with and developed relationships with long before I started my YouTube channel. And even when it was at, you know, 50 subs or, or whatever, like it has nothing to do with that. So don't think that's a limiting thing and go, well, I don't have a big social media following or I don't have this or I don't win races. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I've got other friends that have good discounts set up with, with local shops. That They're just riders, and they're not racers or anything. Else. They're just riders. Yeah, so I think, to for me, this is the, the number one part to kind of attack if you're looking for how to get better deals. And it's not just the deals. I think Mario's touched on it. There are so many benefits to going in and building a relationship with your local dealer. You know, if you are racing and you need a part right before you go, if you've built a relationship over time and it's not in stock, they might take it off another bike and put it on there and get you back out there riding. No, you're not going to get that online. You're not going to get them overnighting a part for you just because you built this relationship. You're, you're just a number when you're buying stuff online. Yeah, I mean, they, you can build up, and I'm not going to name the websites because everybody knows knows who they are. But, you know, a lot of them give, like, cash back rewards, and you build up a little bank, and you – guys, your local dealer can do – and I don't want to say the same thing. They can do better. Like, instead of, oh, well, if you buy enough stuff, we'll give you another discount, and we'll give you – they'll just give it to you up front. I mean, I mean they will because you're somebody that's constantly going to be coming in. And guess what? Where, you know, where, where they have the stuff they can mark down, whether it's parts and accessories, they also know eventually you're going to buy another bike, and you're going to come in – like, or you're going to need riding gear, or you're going to – but, yeah, it's just – it just frustrates me that, that people are relying on the online thing, which don't get me wrong. I order stuff online from time to time because maybe I don't have time to make it over to JT Motorsports this week. And, you know, I need, you know, whatever, a wheel bearing and I need it delivered here to my house. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. I even know some guys that work at dealerships from time to time. That way it's just, it's just convenient. But ultimately, you know, if you put out 
the local dealerships. I mean, where are you going to get your bikes from? Where are you going to get your parts from? And, and the other thing is the mechanics that are working in there, even if you work on your own bike, like I do, occasionally I get stuck and it just, it just happens. And Andrew won't respond to my texts or whatever. So, you know, I'll stop in and, you know, I'll talk to the mechanic and go, Hey, have you seen such and such happen? And normally they'll just say, Oh yeah, you need, you need this. I've even had them loan me out tools before and go here, just bring it back to me next week. No offense to Rocky Mountain ATV. They've never let me borrow any sort of motorcycle specialty tool. That you can only get that through a personal relationship. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about how they get that, right? So I'm sure, you're. It, it, for one, it's going to take time. And I think some of the other things that we talked about apply to this. Go into your local dealership, be con a consistent customer, and then build that relationship with them. And then when you do want to kind of approach that, hey, I would like to see if I can get a deal or get things a little cheaper, take the same approach that we talked about earlier. What are you going to do for them? And sit down with them face to face. That's where they get to see your personality, who you are. Come in there, you know, well put together and just ask. Can I sit down with a parts manager um, or the owner and, and start there and just talk to them, have a conversation with them. There are not enough people doing that. Everyone wants to pick up the phone, text, do something on paper, bring your resume with you, sit down, talk with them um, and say, here's what I think I can do for you. I'd like to be a consistent customer here and get a little bit better deal. Yeah, and I and I and I think you're dead on there. So the, the down if there is a downside to the building the person relationship, unless your best friend opened up a motorcycle dealership, it's gonna take some time to build up. That's the downside. You're not gonna get that necessarily get that automatic discount right up front. Now I have walked into places before off the off the street um and gotten ten percent off or whatever, which is basically what you get online to begin with in most cases anyway. I yeah, mean, but you probably, it's because you had a conversation or you yeah. talked about bikes or you did yeah, something exactly. different, right? But, you know, to get the, to get the type of discounts we get on things, it's going to take a little bit of time to build up. It's going to take a little bit of money. But the cool part is it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, those, those guys, and it keeps them in business. And, and guess what? Those guys change dealerships from time to time. Like the parts manager at one may move over to another. Well, guess what? You're probably going to get a discount over at that one. Like the, those sorts of things happen. It just takes a little bit of time to build up. But then like Brian said, the, the intangible stuff like, oh, crap, you know, I'm going to miss tomorrow's race or I was getting ready to take off on this motorcycle trip and this tire, you know, has a puncture in it. You know, it's not unheard of for, you know, the owner or somebody to go over there and open up the shop after hours to get something for, you know, a value, you know, a valued customer. It happens. It's not going to happen overnight, but, but it will happen. So, yeah, we that's been one of the things that I, I, I guess there are plenty. Eh, I know of a couple, but... I know of a couple of dealerships that maybe I don't want to deal with, but at the same time, there are so many good ones out there. You just got to go in and talk to the guys. That's it. I mean, it just starts with a conversation and then, you know, you might get invited on riding trips and other, like there's all sorts of things that. So much more than money. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's way bigger than that. Like you said, it's hard getting harder and harder, at least on the off-road side to find places to ride. So building those relationships and network, and then you never know who you meet through, through them. So I think that's where if you go into that local dealership, the benefits just, you know, are tremendous. Yeah, it far outweighs anything else. And, and you're right about off-road riding. Like when you first get a dirt bike, every you know, you'll see people. If you're going on to Facebook to ask, hey, where can I go ride off-road? You're doing it wrong. you got to go form some relationships. Go to one trail ride. Make friends with people there, and they'll, you'll get an invite. Hey, did you know about the trail ride coming up next weekend? We're riding down at so-and-so's. Or, hey, what are you doing Wednesday night? We're going out to my buddies to ride. And before you know it, I don't even know how many new places I've found out about in the last year, but basically if I'm going to ride my dirt bike somewhere, I can, hop, I can throw it in the back of the truck right now, not have to pay, and we probably have five, six places within an hour we can go ride. So um, here's the other thing. I mean, we, we kind of touched on this. Uh, you don't have to be some sort of top-level racer. They sponsor sea riders. I mean, it, it happens. They sponsor newbies. And again, you don't even have to ride. You could just be, you could be a blogger. You could be some sort of uh, travel blogger. You could be a YouTuber or you could be a, I don't think anybody's sponsoring us for this podcast. I guess you could be a podcast. Like there's all, there's all sorts of things uh, that can be done. But again, you just have to figure out what you provide. And I think you touched on this before we went on, uh, before we started recording earlier. You want to treat yourself as a business. I mean, that's essentially what you're doing. Yep. You're, you're making a business transaction. So, um, you know, one of the things we did last year, and it's going to be a little bit different this year, is we kicked off uh, a youth racing team. And how, how old are the kids? They're like ages 5 through 12 or something. Yep. 
Um, you know, my son was a part of it. Uh, Brian's son was a part of it. Andrew's 14 kids or however many he has. It's not really 14. What do you have? Four, three racing this year, four by the end of the year. It's close. It's, we're getting close to that. Um, Dave, Dave's son was on it and, and we did something a little bit different instead of just reaching out individually. Cause we were all kind of racking our brains going, God, it's, going to take x number of tires to make it through the season it's going to take x number of chains it's going to take x number of this so we combine resources yep. and we reached out i mean some of them were personal relationships we already had and those were you know those were easy to get we just said hey this is what we want to do and they said what do you want yeah but i think that's what is so important about those personal relationships you know i had personal sponsors and i was able to just you know reach out to them and say hey we have this whole team and it was immediate okay so yeah, we didn't have to tell them what we were going to do we just said we we've got a team and they went, okay. Um, I mean, some of the things we offered, I mean, we kind of combine, you know, not just combine resources, like, like Brian and I were talking earlier, like, if you want to go in and get a discount on tires, I mean, lots, lots of places will probably match the online price, but it's just in, you can get cheaper than the online price when you go in and say, hey, I need 75 off-road tires. That's a whole lot different than going in going, I'm going to need six to get through the season. So maybe you have some buddies, maybe you have some friends, maybe you have family members that are, whether it's racing or you're going to do the trans Atlantic trail, or you're going to do, you know, some other crazy motorcycle trip, or you're going to go road racing or, or whatever. If you got some buddies that are going to be involved in it, you can kind of get a parts list together and accessories list or gear list or whatever. And say, Hey, we want to buy something in bulk. And maybe you don't even need like some sort of great offer of what you're going to provide for them. Maybe it's just, hey, we want to spend a bunch, of, we want to buy a bunch of stuff, and and they might offer you a bulk discount at that point too. Yeah, that purchasing power. You yeah, know, it goes back. A lot of these techniques are all just you know basic kind of business techniques, and you have to apply that to this because, as Mario was saying earlier, you are a business. You treat yourself as a business. Yeah, and it's uh, you know we we were fortunate. I mean, some of the companies, uh, you know, we we presented things to them and they weren't personal relationships. They were just, Hey, we like their stuff. So we want to do that. Um, you know, we want to use their products and, and those sorts of things. And we reached out to them with a business plan. This is what we're planning on doing. Uh, you know, we want to, we want to have customized graphics for all the bikes. So, so, so they look pretty much the same across the board. And we even shared like some of the, these are the other companies we have working with us, which, you know, some of those were legitimate companies and they're like, well, crap if so-and-so sponsored i'm like i want to be a part of that too and then we put out race videos which you know on my youtube channel never get the views that some of my other but it's still thousands of views over the course of the year which is, is pretty solid and it goes back to that point we talked about earlier it's different right? yeah that, nobody nobody else was offering that whether and, and we even had some people go hey i don't know if this is going to work and we sent them an example video that, but i like it and nobody else is doing that so we want to be a part of it and, and it worked out it, it worked out well uh, like I said, we're doing something a little bit different this year. We're changing up our race schedules. Brian and I are tired of driving so far every race weekend to go ride for an hour and a half and then same turn tracks, same tracks <laughs> over and over. Yeah. We did get some new tracks this year with SXCS and, and we're going to have some new ones with the, with them again this year. Um, speaking of SXCX, let's take a, uh, let's take a quick break, tell you a little bit about them and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and kind of wrap up for the day. And that's actually not BS. Uh, Dan LeMay, who I'd never met before last year, had been watching my YouTube channel. And uh, we've become friends with him since then. But, you know, he stopped by my camper one night. Dan will, Dan will vouch. I actually fed him that night. I was in there cooking, and he hung out, you know, out under the, uh, the awning. We had a good time. I think that was down at the, uh, down at the Virginia Motorsports round, I think. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that's been a great series. I mean, last year was the first year for it, and I think it's going to grow some more this year. But, the tracks were awesome. Yeah, just it's something new, refreshing. The fact that they have, you know, different disciplines. My son absolutely loves it. And what I like m most is, you know, stepped up to help volunteer sweep riding. And I'm able to get out there, ride my bike while helping a bunch of other people, seeing how much fun everyone was having out there. Even at the last hangover hair scramble, people are getting stuck. And there, there's smiles on their face. Um, and just being able to get out there and ride dirt bikes again seeing a new series, seeing everyone have fun and being able to ride with my son on the same weekend. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll try to link especially on YouTube. I know I can link it. We'll link Brian's video to hang over hair scramble because people were having fun. Brian, for some reason was having fun digging people out of the mud, riding other people's bikes to get them across, you know, the tough places. Uh, I decided to sit that one out. I'll be back for round two, but, uh, no, it, it's been a great series. And, uh, if you're, if you're new to riding off road, 
I would still say come on out, check it out. Even if you decide not to race the next day, you can still come out and do the trail ride. And uh, if you do want to race, I think I think like the uh, the sprint enduros. So those of you that aren't familiar with that, like a sprint enduro, the way it works is um, you ride one lap or you ride a loop. And there's two different loops. There's like a woods loop, and then there's like we'll just call it you know either grass loop or cross test. But it's usually like a a field that you're riding through. And it takes, depends on how slow you are, but, you know, seven to ten minute range. And you don't really have to worry about racing much because they kind of rack and stack you. So, in theory, you shouldn't catch the guy in front of you and the guy behind you shouldn't catch you. So, you don't really have to worry about banging handlebars. You can just go out and ride fast for one lap and then you get a break and you do that over and over again. Yeah, to your point, there's no better series out there for someone newly getting into riding. It also provides the most riding in a weekend. So almost all the events have a fun ride the day before, the day after. So if you're new to riding and you're a little nervous to try racing, you get to go out on a very similar or the same course and ride it and get comfortable and just have a good time. And maybe you choose to race and maybe you don't, but I think that's the best building block is to get out there and you can truly see what it's like. And I have a feeling you'll definitely be racing. Yeah, just don't sign up for the Vet C class. We have enough people in that one. I'm sick of all the competition. I, I'd like for just like three guys to be there, so I guarantee a podium every weekend. Um, no, we just want to touch on that a little bit. That's a that's a series that, like I said, Brian or like Brian said, he's he's a part of the uh, volunteer group there. We've got some other friends that that help out with that. I know, uh, I know Ryan Knapp, you know, works in that, and and Andrew works in that, and and Dave, and you know, a bunch of our friends that we're probably naming off right now that you guys don't really know, but you'll you'll meet them at some point on the podcast. So, anything else you want to cover on the sponsorship stuff? I feel like we we covered everything we wanted to cover. Yeah, it's just summarizing it up. It's just you know, build relationships. Tr- you know, act professionally. Treat yourself as a a business, and the benefits will be way more than just monetary and saving money or making money. And I think, and we'll have to discuss it. I think we can do this, and if not, I'll just edit this out. But I think we discussed how we've got some examples of Noah and Luke's uh, race resumes that maybe we can throw on a Google Drive or something and make them accessible to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know how to do that for the podcast. Maybe I can put it in show notes. If you go over to twowheelrider.com, I can promise you I will, uh, I'll put a link on there that you can go over to my Google Drive and access those files just for reference. I mean, we'd appreciate it if you don't rip them off totally, but take the ideas from them and, and, and build up your own race resume or just resume for sponsorship. Uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, I'll, I'll link it down in the description below. We'll make, make that super easy for you, but two wheel rider.com. I know I can put them on there. So anyway, uh, dude, this is the first one we got to do. How do you, I mean, I guess the, the uh, listeners will let us know how we did, but how was your experience? Well, this was definitely out of my comfort zone. So definitely nervous, but after we get started talking about motorcycles, you know, it's just fun. It's, like motorcycles are fun. I think that's what, you know. I mean, if you can't have fun talking about motorcycles, then yeah. there's something, there's something wrong. wrong with you, and I don't want to hang out with you. So, anyway, I mean, like I said, future episodes and probably, you know, coming up a few weeks from now, we're going to have some great people on that we get to interview. But Brian and I it's kind of practice for us, too, you know, to see, you know, see how well uh, or how comfortable we are actually doing a podcast. And I've had a, I've had a blast so far this morning. I'm out of bullet bourbon. So, if we decide Same to do here. a second episode today – uh, I'm going to need a, a new pour, but uh, anyway, uh, hope you guys enjoyed the, uh, the first uh, episode. Uh, bear with us. We'll get better. I, I hope we get better <laughs> anyway. Um, but if you did enjoy it and you're watching it on YouTube, obviously give us a thumbs up on there. If you're watching it on, or not watching it, but if you're listening to it on whatever podcast platform, if you want to give us a couple more episodes before you give us a rating, that's fine, but we'd appreciate a rating. Unless it's five star, go ahead and do that right now. We would love that. Um, if you have any suggestions about who you'd like to have on, different types of topics you'd like discussed, and if it's not something we're experts in, we'll go find the expert to come on here and talk about it. Um, you know, send us an email, uh, go over to my Facebook page, uh, two wheeled rider. You can comment on there and say, Hey, for the podcast, we'd like to have so-and-so on and, and we'll, or, or this type of person on, and we'll do our best to uh, get that. And, uh, I'm Mario Orsini. And I guess, uh, for Brian Boyer, we're going to sign off, but we'll talk to you guys again soon. Talk to you soon.